name's Mary Walker. And Hi, Mary. <laughs> this is, we're just going to have fun with this. Okay, so. Uh, right? Hi, Bray. <laughs> <laughs> I'm co-chair of the Multicultural Proficiency Committee. Um, I'm a community member. I've been involved in the community in, in different ways for the last 10 years. Um, and I have come to be a part of this committee as as a part of some of my work with the uh, Board of Education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and my name's Brad Engel, and I'm with the Queen Anne's County Board of Education. This is my 28th year with the school system, and I'm the other co-chair with Mary Walker, and we have been co-chairs together now for a few years, and we wanted to spend some time talking to you today about our Multicultural Proficiency Committee, kind of what we, do what we have done, um, some things that we're currently doing. There's a lot of exciting things that we're doing because we feel like we want to, you know, get the word out. You know, we want to let people know that there are a lot of good people in this community that are working on issues of uh, cultural diversity and increasing the amount of cultural proficiency in the county, in the school system, amongst the school staff and our teachers, in law enforcement, and in all, all the areas. Um, in our county but we want to have fun with this today I mean we have a lot of information to share with you you're going to meet a lot of people and it's going to be hopefully an exciting uh, uh, time for all of you so. our mission is just to embrace the diversity that is in our county and to um, just give everybody a voice uh, and to to meet the needs conversations were just to do that to start people talking about race, there's when you talk, start talking about race, people, you know, kind of clam up. Yeah. Is there race? You know, are people racist? Or is there racism? Yeah. Wake up. There, there's racism, and the reason we don't, because we don't talk about it, we can't dispel it. I'm Jack Broderick. Uh, I uh, live on Kent Island. Uh, Liz and I uh, have been there 40 years, um, last week, actually. Uh, we were young kids with two very young kids, um, and we were looking for a little place on the water, and we found it on Cox's Creek, and we're still there. Uh, raised our kids here, um, good roots in a great community. Uh, I uh, worked for the government. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but uh, I'm retired, very active in the community, and uh, this is being able to be part of this effort. I might say at the invitation of uh, Ed and Merle um, over this past year uh, is something that has a great deal of meaning to me. Um, something I want to do, I've wanted to do for a long time, and uh, it's, uh, it kind of helps fulfill where I am in my life right now. So it's great to be here today and great to be part of this effort. Um, I'm Merle Rockwell and I am relatively new to the county. I've only lived here for eight and a half years, but it's my home. And where I am is where I wanna be and where I wanna contribute. Um, I am a communicator and interested in the way people talk with one another. That's been both my education and my life experience. So I'm really happy to be a part of this group. It means a lot to me, and I have a lot of energy to give back. I'm Ed Modell, <laughs> yes, and me I'm married to Merle Rockwell. We've uh, <laughs> been here, as she said, eight and a half years. Um, I've spent parts of my life, I'm a, I'm a mostly recovered attorney, um, I still do some pro bono work for Midshore Pro Bono, but um, I spent 30 years as an attorney and, and the last 20 years as a mediator and um, executive and, and life coach. But throughout my life, I've always wanted to do something to improve, this particularly re relations between the races. I got involved in the American Civil Liberties Union in 1970 in southeastern Virginia because I was concerned about the way people were being treated there. And uh, this opportunity to work with the Multicultural Proficiency Committee helps me fulfill uh, a lot of my life's work now that I'm 70 years old. 
have an opportunity to do it i feel very blessed and fortunate to be able to when i was very young a long time ago and in college i the civil rights movement was heating up it was early in the early early sixties and i had a enormous sense of fairness that was bubbling up in me and encouraging me in some strong way to get involved i actually became the the SNCC representative on my college campus, which stands for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And uh, the, the peace part of it was very important to me as well. Can we, can we make a difference if we protest peacefully? Uh, because my sense was if we fought back in an angry way, we weren't going to make any headway on it. So, so I participated in sit-ins, and I was living in New England, where I grew up and in Boston and New Haven where there were all kinds of things going on as there were throughout the country at that time. Uh, I felt very strongly about being involved in it. And it's so interesting because at this time of my life now, uh, that sense of fairness has always stayed with me. Uh, it has grown in the sense of how we communicate and give space for people to talk about themselves and be feel as though it's safe to do so and that somebody is listening. And I've become a mediator over time. I'm a professional mediator. I'm also an executive coach. And a lot of the work that I do is in conflict management and helping people how to find a better way to talk with one another. So the whole concept of the Sunday supper sort of brings it all back around for me in the sense that I have an opportunity to continue with that kind of work where I live where I feel maybe I can begin to make a difference. It just saddens me that we have to have these conversations over and over again after all of these years. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, Mary, I was around in the uh, 60s, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I grew up over in, uh, in Arundel, in Pasadena, and growing up in the, uh, mainly the 50s, uh, there was a lot, I mean, it was an extension of the Old South, you might say. Um, certainly reflected um, a great deal of the segregation that existed at the time. Uh, I didn't see a lot of that directly till I was about 10. And the, uh, I'll share a quick story. Um, went to a parochial school. Um, there was another school uptown in Baltimore invited down one time uh, to have a picnic with us, with a group of guys and play ball, have a picnic. And we went over to the little park in Rivera Beach and almost immediately got kicked off. A guy showed up, we went over in the bus and he, see him, coat was kind of blown. I remember him pointing like this. Uh, black kids weren't allowed on that park. And we didn't quite get it, so we went back over to the school, and we had a great picnic with those guys, um, and we played ball on the on the school ground. It wasn't as good a diamond as on the uh, over on the park, but we could play. And I'll never forget there was this one African American kid, guy my age, and we just kind of hit it off. And I looked at him, and his eyes looked so hurt, and I still had that feeling that I felt then. And I didn't realize it at the time, but that would be something that stuck with me the rest of my life. Um, I had some other incidents, you know, as I got older, um, with my parents debating. We had some tremendous debates around the dinner table. Uh, but I have to say, my parents and grandparents were normal white people who grew up in the born in the early 1900s, mid-1900s, just didn't get it. Culturally incompetent. Mm -hmm. uh, loving people, but normal white people didn't get it. Um, I saw some things that bothered me as a kid. And, you know, it wasn't really until after I, uh, I went to school in Baltimore, went to Loyola College, uh, after school, Vietnam was on, you had to do something. So I went in the Army and went to officer candidate school. And it was there that things really opened up for me, a whole different world. Um, 
I served in Turkey, went to language school. It was a Cold War assignment, nuclear weapons. But I suddenly found myself as a minority uh, in a Muslim country, Middle East. I was glad I could speak the language. Um, but I learned a lot of personal lessons there about being a minority. When I got back, I was getting ready to get out of the Army. And the Army was having some terrible problems with race relations at the time in the early 70s. I volunteered. I thought, well, you know, it's going to be hard to market yourself as a nuclear warhead commander. But <laughs> there, was a, there was a volunteer effort in the Army in race relations. So I put my hand up. And I worked for two years helping solve racial problems in the active army before I got out over in D.C. Went in the guard for a couple years doing the same thing. One of the few white guys in the D.C. guard at the time in the mid-70s. Then I went to the uh, National Guard Bureau. And I'm happy to say I was able to work uh, thinking about that young guy over in Bavera Beach who couldn't play on that ball field with us. I was able to work for the rest of my career helping to turn that thing around a little bit. Yeah. Um, I ended up, I worked for the National Guard Bureau for 25 years and uh, ended up becoming the National Director for Equal Opportunity and Civil Rights for the National Guard. I'm very proud of what we did in the Guard, uh, making the Guard what it is today, very diverse and very effective. I, uh, I, I was frustrated, though, in that when I did retire, it was a great career, great retirement. But here locally, I always felt like, you know, I got involved in the community, was involved uh, in environmental stuff, heritage stuff. But it was tough to be able to focus that concern, that energy mm -hmm. on making a difference here in Queen Anne's. And then Ed asked me last spring, I think, would you like to get involved in this effort? And you know, something inside said, heck yes. Mm. So I'm hoping that, that this is an opportunity to make a difference. Now, one quick other thing. Uh, last Friday, I went to a funeral over in Denton, a guy that I knew and loved very, very much, uh, General Jim Frederick, the uh, former adjutant general of the state of Maryland. I worked very closely with General Frederick. And when I first became the director of EO for the Guard, I went up to Baltimore to talk with him because he was making a difference in the Maryland Guard for years. He had a diverse organization. And we sat down and I said, what, what are you doing here that a lot of other states aren't doing? And he said, Jack, my view is you got to nudge fate. He said, I'm the leader here. And I look for opportunities to nudge fate. And, you know, I thought about that a lot. He, he would. He, he was actively involved, but he was doing things that made a difference in people's lives and encouraged people. And I'm hoping that this is a, another opportunity here to be able to nudge fate in Queen Anne's County to help our county be uh, more culturally competent, more understanding, aware, and respectful of one another across our races. Sorry to talk so long. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to add one thing. I just, it's funny how when you start this conversation, suddenly things start to come up that, I, I was trying to think of what was the impetus for it? What was the impetus back in those days, a long time ago for me? And I just remember that I went to visit my brother who was in college in North Carolina. And again, I had grown up in New England where I wasn't seeing a lot until the early 60s, uh, but, but during the 50s when I was sort of a young teenager. Um, I went to visit my brother, and for the first time in my life, I saw a whites-only fountain. I was shocked. I don't think I've ever recovered from it. I thought that's absolutely awful. It's not fair to treat people that way. I can't stand it. And I think that that lays in the back of my mind as I think about the things that we're doing now and the things that we, we hope to help promote and encourage people to participate in in the future is to remember what that feeling was like, as you mentioned, yeah. you know, that, that thing that drives you to want to make a difference, to want to make things better, to listen better, to open up and have a bigger heart, to create the empathy that Ann mentions, how important that is. Uh, the knowledge is very powerful. 
and learning from each other can do all of those things if we let it. So I think this really is the second civil rights movement in the United mm -hmm. States yeah. these days. I've said that for the last year or two. Unfortunately, it, the impetus was some very bad incidents, like starting in Ferguson, Missouri, and, and the whole series that's happened since then. Um, for me, I was uh, I grew up in Connecticut, very integrated school. Um, in, in terms of being in school, not a lot of integration or social integration. But when I came to Charlottesville, Virginia to go to law school in 1968, I was really shocked to learn that it was only in the past very few years in the, from 68 that the schools in Virginia had been integrated. Um, I really was very surprised. When I ended up after law school wanting to be a law clerk to a federal judge in Richmond, Virginia, who had actually been the judge that issued most of the desegregation orders in eastern Virginia, about 40 of them. He himself was uh, they had weekly Ku Klux Klan rallies in Richmond around the federal courthouse. His dog was shot. Um, he, he, he stood up in the face of a lot of ad adversity. Um, but he was the judge I wanted to work for, and I think working for him for a year, I learned an awful lot about civil rights movement and, and fairness in the courts. And, and in fact, the first thing I did when I came to Washington to be a lawyer was I volunteered to work on Congressman Ron Dellum's appeal of his conviction for the May Day demonstration. And that was the time when the, the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement had all merged together in one. And we were able to overturn his conviction. He, for those of you who don't remember, Ron Dellums was an outstanding black congressman from California. And over the years, I had always tried to do some work on, on the side of my corporate law practice in D.C., whether it was the environmental movement or mental health movement, um, and then coming to Queen Anne's County and finding that there was this committee working on these kinds of issues. And we actually learned about these Sunday suppers and conversations on race from our neighbors in Talbot County, where they started it a couple of years ago, and it had a few, and we patterned what we're doing here after uh, what our friends down there were doing. And uh, it's worked out, I think, in incredibly well beyond what we really imagined would happen back in June when we had 150 people at our third conversation on race just a few weeks ago. Um, the, th this th the thing that stands out in my mind was at the second Sunday supper, which was held at c the old Kennard School Building, which was where, which was a segregated school back in the 60s. Um, I sat next to uh, Ms. Madeline Hollis who was a teacher in that school, and she's 89 years old now, and she said she got up to reflect at the end and said that if anybody had told her 65 years ago when she was teaching there as a segregated school that we would be having a Sunday supper and a conversation on race with a mixed group of people, she wouldn't have believed it. And she, she used the word that it was a miracle that we were together that day to, to be able to talk about these kinds of issues of race relations and how to improve them. And, she came to our third Sunday Supper as well, and um, what we heard at the end of the third Sunday Supper I think is really encouraging that we had a lot of teachers and principals and some students there, and, and what they, many of them got up and said at the end was that they want to take this back to their individual schools, the 14 schools and, and the uh, Anchor Academy that we have here, that, that uh, these conversations can be expanded and continue on for the younger people in the county. And I think that's what mm -hmm. our hope is for the future. Mm -hmm. And I liked Lee's comment about it being organic, too, to see that it isn't for us to decide how this all turns out. It will develop as it's going to develop in an organic kind of way based on what people want. But the point is that the process of learning about each other is huge, I think. It's just amazing what we learn and as we learn how we open up even more you know <clears throat> reflecting on the Sunday suppers um, Lee and Ann were talking about the you know the energy and the, the trust that develops mm -hmm. across the table one of the things that hit each of us uh, in as we went into that was how hard it was to hear each other at the table and we're talking about you know round tables eight people sitting around and the more we talked, the harder it was to hear. 
and we were frustrated with the terrible acoustics of the room. Well, one room was senior center. The second room was the Kennard Auditorium, the old school. Uh, the third was the Methodist Church, um, Church Hall. And I got to thinking, you know, these places don't have problems with acoustics. The issue was the energy <laughs> in the room was so unbelievable. Yeah. Folks kept talking, and the more it was kind of like a New Year's Eve party where nobody was really drinking, you know. I mean, <laughs> the, the energy just, just kept getting louder and louder, yeah. and it was because people yeah. were really turned on. Yeah. This was something I think, um, as you guys said, it, it, it's people wanted, wanted to get it, wanted to share. And once it was realized that this was a, an environment where it could be done in a safe way, uh, boy, there was tremendous energy. Yeah. Um, the table Phil was at, they were smart. They got up and walked out and went into another room where they could hear each other, well, you know. Each other. But I, I, to me, that just, it, it, it summed up my own experience with it was, this is really something that I think most of us, uh, not all, but most, um, would like to have an opportunity to do to increase our own understanding, our own respect, and our own awareness. Um, and we hope we're able to continue to do it. I think anytime somebody is, this is just me speaking, and so the only experience I have is my own. Um, if somebody is afraid to enter into a conversation or to get involved, I would ask them to if they can, to suspend their fear and give it a chance. Uh, you'll not know how it's gonna turn out unless you involve yourself in some way. And I think we've uh, structured these conversations on race in a way to make it, as Jack said, a safe place. We've used that term a number of times. We have a, a trained, experienced facilitator at each table. We're not gonna allow people to get right. into loud arguments, uh, we want everybody to speak honestly, but most importantly, we want people to listen to what other people have to say, to hear them uh, fully and deeply, and uh, as other people had said, to have empathy for other people. So, as Merle said, let's suspend your fear, muster your courage, <laughs> and know that uh, that we're, we've set this up in a way as to make it as safe as possible for everybody to express themselves. Yeah. I agree, Ed. I, yeah. I think, too, the supper aspect of it, mm -hmm. uh, we haven't really mentioned that much here, but, you know, it's done around the table over some really good food. <laughs> um, and, and the folks that and have put the, <laughs> put the meals together <laughs> have done a great job. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's something about sitting down. Uh, not quite like a crab feast, but almost, you know, where you, you sit down, you're sharing, uh, you're enjoying something to eat, something to, to drink, some good stuff. That's pretty neat. I'll take some of that. Uh, and in that context, it's a little more relaxing to be able to, uh, to share your, your feelings and your, and your thoughts. And I think it works. Uh, it works. You know, to answer the concern about uh, any fears that one might hold to keep them from having these kinds of conversations in whatever environment or whatever context makes sense for them. I think that we, we think we know and we know nothing until we start talking with each other. And if we as a group can help create those opportunities, then we're gonna to continue to do that. And we wanna hear from you. We wanna know what your thoughts are. We wanna know what hurts you. We want to know what your experience is and what your story is, and we'll listen. So, Mary, maybe we can um, let the people out there know what the future plans are that we have and how people can join in this conversation on race, which will be an ongoing thing for, we hope, quite a long time. All right. Um, one of the things we're doing is planning a th fourth Sunday supper, which may not be on Sunday, but it, it's going to be in February, and it's going to be... Uh, it's going to include public service folk. And then uh, there's a Facebook pay group now talking about race that you can join. Just, you know, give us, a, and it's closed, but we're, we're inviting friends to, to, to come. 
And then um, we are talking about what are the next steps. You know, one of the things we do real good is talk. (laughs) (laughs) We talk and we talk and we talk again. So people really would like to see something happen. And so on that page, we're going to have a next steps meeting um, January the 16th. We don't have all the details on it, but it's going to be an evening, maybe potluck. We're going to find a location. And if you want to come out and talk about what do you see as the next steps for a group, yeah. we're going to continue to talk, but we'd like to do something other than talk to. So at any rate. And anybody who wants to get uh, on our list, and uh, we do have an email address. It's QAC Sunday Suppers at gmail.com no no dots or anything qac sunday suppers at gmail.com um, you can send us an email and we'll put you on the list for notices about what we're doing in january or future events or if you have comments or questions or suggestions we would love to receive them and help us uh, expand what we're doing and i'd like to invite young people not, not that this group isn't young <laughs> <laughs> younger <laughs> younger but <laughs> We would like to get some energy, the energy of young people involved um, in, in this. It, it, it's, it, I think what happened, I was talking to young people today that the young people took over this movement in the 60s. That's what we're looking, it's probably gonna happen again, that the young people are gonna take up this, this banner with, the, with some of the support of the older generation, but we're looking for younger people. So. Please come out and join us in any way that you can. Mm-hmm.